on YouTube also, so you can follow us on uh, YouTube. People who are not able to join here. I'm about to begin my presentation, but if you want to uh, make it like an interactive session, I'm all right with that. Um, I'm just thinking, can you actually see the presentation? Yeah, yeah, we can see, we can see. So it's gone again. Yeah, we can see, we can see now. Yeah, is the screen I visible? I can do it slide show. Is that visible for everyone? Yeah, yeah, it is visible. Nice. Great. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. So when I actually, when we heard about this virus, that is the severe acute respiratory corona syndrome, corona 2, that's SARS-CoV-2, which led to the disease coronavirus 19 or COVID-19, as we famously know. I think us as a healthcare worker, we were always ready and we were out there to assess the patient, get going with it and treat it until it actually hit us, the reality and the intensity and the fear of unknown when we didn't know what's going to happen and how to actually treat. So today it marks 106 days when COVID-19 was actually officially declared as a pandemic. So when I was approached by the organizers and Kusum and I was given the topic challenges faced by an ICU nurse during COVID-19, I was thinking what I'm going to say and how is it going to be, what I'm going to include in my slide. So I actually went ahead and I asked them. I asked them their real-time experiences of the ICU nurses. And here are some of the things that they actually told me and some of the experiences that we felt. So before COVID, you would, might say to your colleague that you need to pop out to the loo and get a drink of water and you'll be back in 60 seconds. But now the simplest self-care activity requires stripping the equipment, going in the safe zone, then getting regarbed. And the reality is you wouldn't do it because of the cost of time involved and the equipment that is too high. Some felt it was too hot. It was physically draining they felt that it was like a war and we didn't have enough bullets to actually fight it. And there were changes, multiple changes in the manner which we worked. And now that we use, are currently working in, it was definitely a roller coaster ride of emotions. People used to cry, they were stressed, uh, they were worried, there was fear of unknown, of going back to your loved ones and not knowing how to meet them. Some also felt, I read this in the Nursing Times, that it is once in a lifetime opportunity and the experience that actually has come through to us. Because this is a time when actually nurses probably would be looked up to more and we can build up on more research opportunities and see what and how we can contribute. And many were actually proud of their work family as well during this unprecedented times. Um, one of my colleagues said that she would wake up at three o'clock because she was worried and she would learn all the maximum doses of the inf uh, infusions. She would memorize them because obviously you're not allowed to take your phones or logging into your network or Medusa to see what's going on. And definitely I'm sure everybody's actually experienced it that all age groups are at risk. It is not limited to elderly. It is not limited to children or anybody like that. Many missed basic human connection. Anybody resonates with that? How can I actually see the chat box here? Anyway, some felt they were boiled in a bag because obviously you're wearing like a space shoot suit and you have hood under over you, you're tied up around your waist in case if you're not fit tested for any of the masks. And a lot of patients were dying. I, I remember discharging one of the patients to the ward and he was in tears, probably thinking he was lucky to be alive. But everyone who looked after him was also in tears because it just gave us hope that we're not fighting for a, a dying cause. It was a life-changing experience, both personally and professionally. Anybody who resonates with that? Thank you. 
Guys, anybody who resonates with that? Participants, please don't present your screen. I repeatedly, I am repeatedly saying this from the first day of webinar. All right, don't worry. I'll continue with my trip. You can uh, now do it again. Yeah, sure. Sorry, sorry for the... No, 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 that's fine. As long as everybody can actually see it. Yeah, I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Does anyone resonate with it? You can actually unmute if I'm asking. And if you want to share something, it's great with me. So once I asked them all these real-time experiences, I moved on and I looked up into a case study. There was a 40-year-old man who was a non-smoker and no travel history, an absolutely healthy man who was admitted with symptoms of fever, chills, fatigue, and shortness of breath. He told his doctors he first noticed the symptoms of mild chills and dry cough, but he didn't really seek uh, medical help immediately until another week where his chest x-ray revealed multiple patchy shadows in both lungs and tests that had actually showed that he was COVID-19 positive. He was immediately admitted in an isolation ward and given supplemental oxygen through face masks. And after receiving medications and antivirals and antibiotics, his temperature came down. However, the cough and the breathlessness and the fatigue persisted. On day 12 of his illness, his breathing became more labored and needed ventilator support. And despite receiving high flow therapy, his saturation dropped to 60%. So he went on to being on a ventilator and later on on ECMO, that is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation and further care continues to be treated at present. So that kind of showed me, looked up on the statistics that given this COVID-19 severe hypoxic respiratory failure, in an ICU, we're estimating about a 1.9 million admissions, about 9,60,000 needing ventilation. So you can imagine the amount of stress and amount of pressure and how much uh, we are in dire need of expansion. So when I looked up into this data, the, obviously our topic came into our mind. What are the key challenges that this pandemic is facing? Anybody who wants to pitch in? Anybody who thinks what could be the key challenges or something that they faced? No one? If anybody has been working in a ward or ICU. Or shortage of PPE. They are saying shortage of PPE to protect yourself own. They are facing. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So I've kind of put it into uh, six sections here, like personal management, resource management, clinical decisions, adaptive changes, infection control and prevention, and patient management. The kind of overlap uh, in terms of how they are being treated and what were the key challenges. I'm just going to um, touch on each point. In case if I miss out something, you can always ask me later, or you could actually pop in, pop in your questions now. As many of you mentioned, lack of PPE or the correct PPE or personal protective equipments. Because when this started, obviously it, it was very new and nobody knew what, how and what would be the best way of protecting and the best uh, PPEs to be used. So, and it was continuously changing. Given the fact that we were in England, it was rapidly changing because initially uh, in UK was not hit. It was other European countries before it actually hit us. And then finally, when it hit us, it was more of using a normal uh, surgical face mask, which is fluid uh, resistant. So everybody kind of felt that that was not fair enough and we couldn't do it. So one of the IC consultants said, obviously, we need proper PPE to be, fe to be felt safe enough to be looking after the patients who are actually generating aerosols and droplets that can actually infect the people looking after him. So the main priority was the health of the um, 
healthcare workers. So looking at this slide here now, uh, one of the main concerns were skilled personals. So as my previous slide showed, the number of uh, ICU admissions obviously increases. So that automatically increases the number of people you need to look after them. So they had to redeploy patient, uh, uh, staff. So they redeployed staff from wards, from theaters, people who had previous uh, ICU experiences, nurses from critical uh, care outreach team, even retired personals who had recently left the job were asked to come back to work and help out. People and nurses who were waiting for their pin were put on a temporary emergency register so that they could help out with the extra load that we were going to be facing. But with that, when you redeploy these people, there is another fact that you need to train them because obviously not everybody is ICU trained. So what happened is when uh, we were from 14 bedded ICU to 40 bedded ICU and you only have say 10 or 15 or 20 ICU trained nurses. So they are, are looking after six patients with other six nurses who are not ICU trained. So they had the pressure of training them on the job. They had the pressure of supervising them, making sure that all the care that is being given is actually right, reviewing them and making clinical judgment then and there. So this put a lot of pressure, a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of decision making that actually, when you're in ICU, you're obviously looking after and you have your IC bundles to back you up. But in a scenario where you're just there and you have to make all the decisions, you can't move out, you're wearing all these uh, equipments and PPEs, you can't really move out and you're just left with them to help them. It can be quite hard to teach them hourly monitoring and things like that. So that was a key challenge that the nurses faced here. But eventually, obviously, we came up with checklist and there were trainings for them uh, so that they could be better equipped with everything that was within the event, um, ICU setup. The next was a risk assessments for staff. Uh, we obviously have a lot of staff who are at higher risk when they're looking after patients like this, say pregnant females, patients who are already having existing medical conditions. So they had to be risk assessed, which was a bit delayed given the current scenario that it was all new. So uh, once the risk assessment was done, a lot of uh, staff went on shielding or self-isolation. So they were given a letter from their general practitioner or GP to go and uh, st stay at home to be safe so that they don't end up being sick. So that, again, reduces the number of personnel who are actually at work. <clears throat> Sorry. And then fit testing, it obviously uh, got delayed. And once you're wearing a mask and then you don't fit test for it, then you try another mask, you don't fit test for it. And then you have to wear a hood with visors, which is heavy, you're hot and you're in there. And as I said in my first slide, you're in there for probably six hours, not taking it out. So it can be quite a stressor for you when you're looking after and making all these life-changing decisions for them. Fear, there was a lot of fear, fear of protecting yourself, fear of going back home to your loved ones with kids and how do you approach them? How do you look after them? So you would just, you know, a shower at here, wash your hands multiple times just to make sure that when you go home, you're not trans transferring or transmitting anything else to your household. Uh, there was burnout. I know a lot of people cried not just because there were a lot of deaths, but just because of sheer pressure that was happening. So to ensure that we had to bring in um, breaks, here they in instilled like a, a, a strategy where they divided people into two groups, like group A and group B. So group everybody was briefed about the patient and everybody was told about how the situation is within the ICU. And then one group would go in and look after the patients, say for four to six hours, and then they come out and group B goes in to replace them so that they can don off and take care of it. But this only ha happened after later stages, but initially everybody struggled with how to relieve them, how to make sure that they have enough breaks, because you obviously do not want your healthcare worker to burn out and to give up in a situation like that. There was uh, concerns of staff well-being, of anxiety, of fear, of them breaking down, of them not uh, turning up to work. Because as a healthcare person, you're committed to your work and you are passionate about looking after people. And this was not just a learning journey, but something where you're trialing and trying to get something right. 
Um, communication, again, that was another key concern when we looked into um, COVID-19, because obviously you have all these masks and gears on and you can't really hear anything or communicate anything clearly. Initially, we started using walkie-talkies to communicate with the doctors, to let them know what's the clinical conditions, and then uh, tell them what we've already done and what could be the possible next step. But eventually, it moved on to using an iPad where you could actually see them and FaceTime and show them that, okay, this is what the screen looks like, and this is how the patient's doing. You've already collect, uh, corrected the electrolytes. You've already tried to... Uh, wean patient off, or you've altered the uh, PEEP and the FiO2 values, you've looked into the gases, you've checked um, how the patient is doing in terms of their renal functions or cardiac fun functions, and you're looking into um, a holistic approach of the patient. Um, and of course, team spirit, there, there could be attitude clashes, there could be tires, it could be tiresome. So you just have to make sure that you being an ITU trained nurse are constantly present there to help them make decisions and also help them move forward in their own shift. So I think from a nursing perspective and you're a nursing personal, you're not just looking into the medication aspect or the ventilator aspect. You're looking into a holistic patient. You have to make sure of the pressure source. Um, you have to look into uh, the feed and the um, hydration and nutrition aspect of the patient. You're looking into if the patient needs any renal filters or dialysis. Is the patient actually improving? And all these patients actually require quite a long, um, extended, prolonged oxygen support. So in terms of nursing, it was quite heavy. I'm sure everybody felt it, all the uh, frontline workers, if, despite being in the ICU or in the ward. But just because ICU is a bit more specialized and you're only dealing with people who are really, really deteriorating, you look into all of that. Then moving on to resource management, there's like constantly changing dynamics. You're uh, making sure you uh, order for supplies and there's enough supplies, there's enough scrubs, there's enough masks, there's enough uh, suits to be donned, there's enough crocs because they eventually made um, a room where you do not enter with your own shoe, you remove it outside and you only enter with your crocs or other shoes, which is only to be used in the ICU to minimize any kind of um, infection coming out or going in. So you're kind of entering a red zone and then that's it. You just do not doff off any of your PPE without taking everything off before you come to a clean area. So in terms of adequate supplies and protection, as somebody also shared, um, PPE was a major concern and making sure you had the right PPE. Um, here in the wards, you actually still continue to use surgical uh, fluid repellent mask and a normal apron if you're working with non-COVID or suspected patients until they are actually in a specialized unit where they'll be doing uh, aerosol generating procedures such as intubation or suctioning, only, when, only then you'll be actually properly donning all these things or in case if there's an emergency uh, call that you have to attend. Um, adequate ICU equipments. With the increase in the number of patients, obviously we were not prepared to have all those kind of ventilators. So eventually, all the ventilators that we had in theaters, in HDU, everything was put up and everything was brought around to make sure that we had enough. And it was more was ordered, whether it was old model, new model, just to make sure that we can support the patient uh, at the earliest. <clears throat> Medication management. Now here, with so many patients up in our ICU, you're obviously putting them on ventilators. So what happens is once you're presented in the ED or the emergency department with, say, um, uh, COVID symptoms and you're deteriorating, or you're on a ward and you're deteriorating and they take you to an ICU, obviously the number of patients increases and with the number of patients who are intubated increases, they need to make sure that they have enough medications to actually paralyze them, sedate them. So initially, obviously they were using um, propofol and uh, ramifentanil, but we ran out of them at one point in time. We ran out of them and we had to switch to metazolam and morphine, which is harder to wean off in terms of uh, weaning off the patients. Because when you're using uh, proof of fall, it's a short acting or has a short life. So you can wean the patients off quicker. With a decrease in the number of medications that were available, midaz and morphine made it harder to wean off the patients as well. And to make sure that you have enough to support all the patients and uh, the route of medications that's been given via the feeding tube. And you have enough 
enough of all of that. So stock had to be built up. You had to pile up. You had to make sure that enough has been ordered so that we do not run out. But this was all a learning phase. When the first month or the first few weeks hit us, it was uh, running around and making sure everything's done as best as we could until we learned and make sure there was a plan in place. Um, in an IC, you would have somebody who's inside already and you would have a runner outside so that you can you don't have to continuously go out. So you could just tell that person, okay, this is what you need and that person can get it for you because you're not getting everything inside because of high risk of contamination or, tran or transmissions. Um, with clinical decisions uh, correlating with patient management, it's obviously uh, early identification and discussing about the ceiling of care. You're trying to understand uh, what is the patient presented with? How um, much is he deteriorating? Is he good enough with having just supplemental oxygen? Will he be able to um, maintain his SATs? But we are looking at anything above 90, 92, or 96%. If, there, if the supplemental oxygen is good enough or a high flow oxygen is good enough, or will the patient be deteriorating and need intubation? So having this discussion with the patient and discussing about the ceiling of care, whether the patient is for DNA, CPR, or is he, is he not to be resuscitated? So this is something that you have to have initially, unless the patient is obviously a red call and there can't be any decision made at that point in time, unless you can contact the family. Um, and looking at that, you're obviously looking at what choice of ventilations you're going to make. As I mentioned, oxygen or uh, supplemental oxygen or high flow oxygen or intubation. So those kind of discussions and early um, um, decision-making was very vital to make sure that you're not overloading the, um, the ICUs and the zones that have been turned into ICUs and making the best decision in terms of patient management as well. Uh, this also led to um, looking into sepsis management. When, you, when the patient is admitted in theater, um, sorry, in ICU and you're looking at the patient and he's obviously intubated, there are other factors that come into play in normal sepsis management, you would probably try and give a fluid challenge, but with COVID-19, that was not the case. You had to be very um, considerate and judicial when you're using the fluids uh, when re uh, resuscitate, when getting the patient out of sep sepsis. So when the patient was actually presented in ED, in the panel of bloods that they would run, they would also do a procalcitonin levels, which are like the bacterial markers. So you know if it's just the COVID-19 or is it like a bacterial marker or a bacterial sepsis as well? So you would know if you want to start an antibiotics right away and it is done um, over a series of time to make sure that you can wean off the antibiotics appropriately and just support the lungs as best as you want to. Uh, researchers have actually shown that a conservative strategy of fluid management actually improved the uh, lung function and reduced the need of mechanical ventilation. So they didn't want to overload the um, uh, uh, overload the body with fluids. So it is important that we kind of understand that if it's just COVID-19 symptoms or is it concurrent with any kind of bacterial infections. So doing um, the procalcitonin levels really helped with that. Um, then obviously when the patient is on into, uh, is intubated, and as I said before, these patients require longer duration of oxygenation and higher levels. It was really hard to wean them off. They were like, usually we'll try and wean them off on like seven, 10 days, five days, given the patient's conditions and the changes in the ABG bloods and the gases and how the patient is improving. But a comp with uh, these uh, COVID-19 patients, most of them, needed ECMO. The researchers don't really support ECMO. Some of them, obviously it's needed because it's better with oxygenation. It's like a machine outside, which is just oxygenating your body and membranes, but it is expensive. And there are com a couple of complications related to that in terms of bleeding, stroke, infections. So you're looking into those complications, uh, looking into um, uh, coagulopathy, uh, DVTs or any kind of uh, PEs that might develop when the patients are on it. So it's kind of an overall system management where you're looking at when you are um, focusing on these patients as you would do in an ICU patient. But with COVID-19, you're actually trying to get their lungs to work better. Um, that is your prior motive. And then you're trying to rule out if the usual things that you used to work is still good enough to be um, continued to be doing. Uh, one of the more major 
hard parts is also having a difficult conversation with the family because it's like the patient is presented in ED or the patient is in a, uh, in a ward and suddenly deteriorates and you have to take that uh, patient up to ITU for ITU care and having that difficult conversation because the last time probably you saw your uh, loved one was when they were all right and just developing some kind of cough at home. And now they are at, uh, in the ICU and they will be intubated. There will be tubes in. It's not really a very pretty scenario and you're not looking at it unless you are very technologically advanced and you're looking at what's happening in your family. The last time probably you saw them or even seeing them with a tube in their face, it's not really heartwarming. So it was quite an overwhelming situation when you are having these difficult conversations with family as to why we are putting uh, them on, on a tube. They will be sedated, they will be paralyzed, they might not be able to talk a little for a couple of days and then they will be kept on these machines to help support them. And then uh, looking into if they would actually lead to having a palliative care or end of life care. Um, so that conversation here, mostly our doctors took up to that role. Um, uh, and then the matrons uh, of, ICE, uh, of the ICU, critical care matrons, they took up the role to have a difficult conversation so that all the burden was not on the nurses. And our family updates, that was done on a daily basis just to make sure that they are aware as to what we are doing and how things are and if it's progressing and how good or well or slow it's progressing. Um, moving on to infrastructural changes. As I mentioned, because the ICU beds were supposed to be double, triple, given the fact that our hospital is in a place which is close to London, so the burden was obviously higher. So the surge in the ICU capacity was increasing. According to WHO, one in six person actually becomes seriously ill who would actually need an intensive care unit. So if, with that in mind, we kind of overnight turned our ICUs, HTU, theater, recovery zones into some uh, into a high critical care area where they, these patients would be brought in, they would be intubated, and they would be look, looked after. They changed the entire block to a red block, where a uh, red zone rather, where only positive patients would be there and you wouldn't be uh, looking into um, going in that zone if you're not working there. So that kind of a structural change to be made to move around people, to move around equipments, to move around everything that you would possibly need, to have help from uh, physiotherapists, from your uh, intensivist, from um, your um, chest physiotherapist and your critical care um, team was very vital at that point in time to make sure all these decisions were made in good time where we could support the patients who were coming in. Um, repatriation and offloading. At a point in time, obviously, we had quite a high number of patients who were not being able to be here. So you had to offload them off to different areas like Norwich or Ipswich, like different hospitals in different areas so that all the hospitals would be able to help in this pandemic. And repatriation was mostly done um, for ECMO patients. We used to repat them to a different hospital, uh, to Papsworth. So one of our patients where I present, uh, where I discussed about the case study, he was presented here, was in our hospital for about 10 days and then was repatriated for ECMO, was stayed there for 73 uh, days, is it? Um, yeah, and then he came back to our hospital and he's still here with us recovering at this point in time. So you can imagine how long the oxygenation needs and how long your body needs could be. It definitely depends on a comorbidities, but as I said earlier, it is not limited to a particular age group. It could be anyone who's above the age of 60, um, uh, some people with comorbidities such as um, asthma, they were seen to be at a higher risk, with diabetes, they will seem to be at a higher risk. Um, so we had to look into their comorbidities as well. But there were patients who did not have any comorbidities. They were absolutely healthy who came here and they were fine. Uh, they, they ended up being uh, a serious deteriorating case of COVID-19. Um, patient transportation, in terms of when we talk about the COVID-19, of course, everybody knows infection control and prevention is the major key. Um, despite everything, everybody has to come together to make sure that we can contain it, contain the transmission. 
So obviously they put into place uh, effective hand hygiene, making sure that you do it properly. There were showers uh, put up here so that you could shower before you go home. Um, proper donning and donning, doffing off of your PPEs, which is very important. Negative pressure rooms. So initially, uh, the ICU only had uh, some pods which were negative pressure rooms, and then they bought in few um, equipments which were quite noisy, but they were meant to keep the area as a uh, negative pressure until they properly put in the negative pressure in place. Um, and um, the now what we look forward to is with the cases decreasing and in case if the second wave comes is the nosocomial infections, just to make sure if there's a carrier or if there's something on the surfaces, you we are not giving it to them while they're in hospital. So we have a plan for that as well with um, Public Health England. We are looking into swabbing every patient, obviously, who comes through ED and then swabbing them on every fifth day and then on the uh, subsequent 15th day. But if it comes out positive at the seventh or eighth day, it's actually considered as nosocomial infection. And then they investigated and rapid reviews are done about how the patient got the um, test as positive if initially was negative. I do know that some of these uh, swabs can be false negative. So that's all just still learning and still ongoing. Uh, with preparation and implementation of uh, rapid isolation protocols, obviously visiting was stopped. Um, everybody on in the hospital, even while you're walking around the corridors, um, needs to have a mask, proper hand hygiene, audits are being done, surveillance are being done. Uh, staff all around the hospital and even the ICU are being trained about aerosol generating procedures and how and when it would be appropriate to do it and when not to do it, especially in case if there's a cardiac arrest and you're, you're the first one to see it, you call for help. You do not start doing any kind of procedure because you are not completely in uh, level three PPEs. So you make sure that you call for help and you um, bring everything around you. But you do not bring the crash trolley inside um, just to maintain that a kind of a, a drop the transmission. And once everybody's done, then you carry on doing everything else. So uh, it was in, it is vital that we continue to follow the infection control prevention and keep coming up with more ideas and share with each other as to how we are trying to contain it. Uh, patient management, as I discussed before, uh, early identification and sealing of care. And choice of ventilation, if it's going to be a, ventil uh, a ventilator or a non-invasive ventilation, or does the patient need to go on an ECMO? Initially, when the patients came to us, they were uh, intubated at ED or intubated in the um, ICU because of the simple fact, because you're trying to contain the um, transmission of aerosol generating procedures and the droplet transmission. So you're trying to maintain a closed circuit in terms of everything that you could do. Uh, until the negative pressures were uh, put into place. And uh, with those things, obviously, the studies have shown that in terms of any um, lung conditions in relation to ARDS or acute respiratory uh, syndrome there, prone positioning is good, which is not easy. It is hard because you need more personal and you need to make sure that the patient is not fighting and is sedated enough and uh, the patient is well enough to be prone all the tubings are in place, all the parameters and hemodynamic stability is maintained. Um, the proning actually, it shows that um, uh, it actually recruits the previously collapsed alveoli in the posterior lungs. That's the benefit of proning. So it improves the uh, secretion management and it shifts the perfusion from anterior, uh, in the anterior lungs. So because you're proned at the back of your um the backside of your lungs is expanded and it's bigger. And when you're prone, these secretions come out quicker and your alveoli that are in the posterior are kind of working much better to make sure there is more perfusion in your anterior aspect as well that improves the uh, ventilation perfusion for these patients. And the studies have shown that there are uh, better results um, uh, with proning. So sometimes the patients would be prone to say 12 hours and um, and then you're obviously deproning them. But it totally depends alongside as to how their hemodynamic stability is, the tubes are not moved and the feed that the patient is on. Uh, with filters, you're looking at patients' uh, bloods and renal functions. Obviously, it's more like the patient is presented and uh, you're treating the patient for his lungs. 
And then once you're uh, treating the patient for the lungs, you identify it, you intubate the patients, their renal functions with coagulopathy in terms of giving them frusimide to keep them dry, uh, they can land up into AKI. But as I mentioned, with sepsis management, you're not really going to flood them with war, uh, with fluids. You need to make sure that you uh, use them judicially and conservatively, as the study suggests. That might help them to be um, weaned off quicker. Weaning off patient, as I discussed before as well, in terms of medication, uh, when the shortage was there, that made it harder. Because the patient's uh, PEEP and uh, FIA2 are higher, it makes it harder. You're trying to wean them off. Um, when the requirement of FiO2 is comes down to 50%, that's when you're trying to wean them off. So all these cumulatively, I believe, were a key challenge and key learning area and something that everybody looked into because even though it typically presents as an ARDS, there are some changes, some things that might work, might not work. The queries if um, corticosteroids should be used or not used. Mm, where did I read it? I read... Um, that corticosteroids can actually um, not be that beneficial, but in terms when you're trying to wean the patients off, you could give them about 200 or 100 mg uh, just when right when you're weaning off because otherwise it's going to not be easy. Um, here, the first line of treatment uh, usually was azithromycin um, in, uh, for patients be, uh, and temporarily chloroquine, but um, antibiotics were only started if they suspected that the patients also had some kind of um, bacteria overload going on in, in them. So healthcare systems must balance between saving the most lives and prioritizing the care based on the likelihood of the clinical benefit. That was something that had to be looked into because when we were running short of uh, hemo uh, dialyzers and when we were uh, uh, running short of any kind of supplies and pumps, so you had to prioritize which patient to do first, which patient has higher uh, clinical benefit and how to go about with it. And uh, you had to prioritize. So those kind of immediate clinical decisions were very important despite the pressure that was on. Despite all the odds, you had to make sure that you make the best clinical uh, decisions uh, to make sure you get the, uh, you know, making sure you had the best clinical benefit. Yeah, yeah. Corticosteroids actually, as I was saying, it increases the plasma viral load, and it, the clinical conditions, as per some studies, say that it is um, worsens. So it was not like the first drug of choice um, when we were looking into it. Moving on, as I was saying, so COVID nineteen appears to be in several phases. So management actually depended on depended on when the symptoms started and what's the trajectory of the phase. So early phase didn't really show much respiratory failure. Um, uh, it kind of affected the vasculature and procoagulation. Uh, the dimers would increase, and um, so uh, that had to be looked into. And later, the patient would definitely be involved in ERDS and bacterial pneumonia. So as you could see on my slide, it depends on if it's COVID-19 with mild ARDS or moderate to severe or if the patient needs adjective therapy. So depending on those things, uh, the patients were intubated um, initially, but now as we've learned and in the later terms, we've tried on to use more non-invasive mechanisms uh, with, non, um, with negative pressure rooms just to make sure everything is contained and everybody's not intubated. Uh, because the clinic, uh, critical um, symptoms would usually occur between one to two weeks after the onset of symptoms. And uh, biomarkers would be different, as I was mentioning earlier. So a management of COVID-19 so far, um, as per WHO guidelines and the other guidelines that I have here, if anybody would like to go, they could also check into in Intensive Care Society. They have shared some really nice summaries on the studies that they did in terms of ventilation perfusion mismatches and uh, coagulopathies and how to manage and what's the uh, best and strong weak points. So there you could also have a bit more understanding in terms if you want to read further. So it was looked into protecting lung ventilation, fluid conservative strategies, early prone ventilation for severe ARDS, and neuromuscular um, blockade for moderate severe ARDS and referral to ECMO centers in case if we had, didn't have. 
Um, when I was talking about reducing um, transmission there, with the breathing units, there are certain filters that can be used to kind of minimize the transmission. So a hydrophobic mechanical filter at bag mask uh, interface could be used. You could see in the um, slide that it is marked with a black. And then uh, you could see there's like P valves, which is also marked. And you could use HEPA filters, you could use um, heat and um, a, a HEPA filters, and you could use like um, a heat and moisture exchange filters and a combination of both to make sure that you're minimizing uh, any kind of secretions or any kind of um, um, droplet transmission from any kind of uh, surface, because it should be definitely tightly fitted to ensure there's no disconnection, especially if you're going to prone the patient. So what is the way forward and the truth? Well, everybody is vulnerable to COVID-19, as I mentioned, and COVID-19 has certainly more certainly not change the level of care. It has become harder, but the mission still remains to uh, provide far level care despite the circumstances. There are higher level of death threats. If you see the reported 28 ICU mortality rates are high, 62%, uh, greater than mortality rates seen in severe ARDS and fatality rate of COVID is three to four, which is lower compared to Middle East Respiratory syndrome, MERS, that is 34%, or SARS, 11%. But the death rates have certainly exceeded the combined death rates of MERS and SARS. So the possibility of second wave is inevitable. Therefore, what is the need of the R? To make sure that we have plans in place, rapidly looking forward to assessments and staying calm through chaos, reviewing strategies with regard to IC space, staff, supplies, and standards, to future-proof infection control and critical care ca capabilities and capacities. So in case if there's a crisis, we are much better prepared and there would be less load on the staff, on the hospital, on the resources, on the budget, on the patients. We'd be much better planned and um, um, uh, we would know how and what steps to move forward into. So my key message would be, I actually read this uh, really good analogy the other day, which said, if you jump out of a plane, you're plummeting towards the ground. You deploy your parachute to slow the descent, but you don't think, oh, parachute's working, I'll cut the strings off. So basically you're coming down, but that doesn't really mean you need to stop everything that you're doing in terms of whether it's social distancing, whether it's in terms of wearing masks, whether it's in terms of maintaining hand hygiene practices. This is the new normal, probably implementing better and good um, infection control practices, making sure that we move forward, uh, building up on new researches. So we have to, to do th things differently. We'll have to see things in a different perspective. Just even if you look at the webinar, we are looking at things differently, where people from around the world are trying to share their practices as to how it was managed and how different it was um, for all of us. I would love to take any questions here because um, I'm done with my presentations, if there is any. Hello. You're very welcome, uh, Kalpana. Uh, in terms of our staff uh, management, eventually they kind of uh, bought around like uh, debriefing one to one. They came up with um, um, they came up with airport lounge. You know, the airports air flights are not running, so the airport lounge was quite kind enough to come to to us with some goodies and uh, they would be there in case if any any staff wanted to talk to them, just, you know, let it out to feel lighter. And obviously I'm sure everybody is, um, everybody is looking into um, the ethnicity where we are looking into blacks, Asians or minority groups to be at a high risk, but it's still an ongoing thing. We do not know the reason why. I think somebody's asking NIV and um, nebulizer is um, 
uh, aerosol generating procedures. So what is the alternative? Well, they stopped uh, nebulizers uh, and they were looking into using spacers more. And in terms of NIV, um, they were looking into um, OptiFlow and um, high intensity, but again with HEP, uh, with filters, with uh, HME filters, which would uh, make sure that the, um, uh, these, uh, the aerosol generation is less and they are, that they are in negative pressure rooms and that you are properly gowned. Because when you did not have uh, negative pressure rooms and when you did not have adequate PPE, then giving them something which will generate procedures puts you at a very high risk. And obviously you do not want to put your healthcare workers at that kind of risk. So you're trying to put everything else in place before you implement or try on the NIVs. And um, obviously, even if you go on the floor and you're putting them on high level of implemental oxy uh, supplemental oxygen and putting them expecting 96%, then they're deteriorating to 92%. And then you're thinking of putting them on an NIV. You will make sure everything else that needs to be put, uh, put in place so that you are safe and minimizing the time that you spend there is enough. Because um, obviously, I'm sure with... Um, BiPAPs and CPAPs, it's harder for the patient and you might see they, they would just take it off. So the compliance would be less. So um, Opti, um, OptiFlow and those kind of um, NIV procedures were quite helpful. And that's what I read. Okay, okay Ruchika, Ruchi, Ruchika, are you there? Ms. Ruchika? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Good afternoon. Ruchika, you can ask your question. Good afternoon. You can ask your question on mic. Uh, that would be better. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, Zwati, ma'am. Uh, it was really an informative session. It was really good. So I was wondering, ma'am, you said that in sepsis patient, we don't give fluids. But here in India, we generally start with three liter of fluids and then followed with cultures and antibiotics. So how do we treat COVID patient when they have sepsis or we diagnose them with sepsis or a suspected case of sepsis? Uh, I wouldn't say three liters. The usual choice is um, with sepsis, obviously, as you said, fluids is a usual choice, but they would be looking into giving crystalloids uh, at a very low rate and uh, looking into what was the cause. Obviously, blood cultures are being done even here, blood cultures, um, um, urine cultures, and all of that will be done to determine if there is a bacterial overload or if it's just viral overload. And as I was saying, calcitonin can be used to determine if there's a bacterial marker to start them on antibiotics. And then you'll be using norepinephrine as well to uh, maintain their MAP, I mean arterial pressures and uh, risk suppressants to make sure all of this together can bring down the um, as, as sepsis and the lactic uh, clearance because you don't want to increase the fluids in and lead to an overload, which will just in uh, in you just hamper the lungs and the heart. But are you start uh, doing three liters of fluids? Yeah, no, ma'am, uh, it's clear now. I was thinking that why we don't give fluids. So I think it's because of the, it will, uh, uh, it will affect the breathing of the patient. So breathing will be labored and... Yeah, because these studies are showing that uh, with higher fluids, it's not that beneficial. Weaning off the patient from the ventilator would be harder. So your, your focus is on the lungs while you're managing everything else as well with these patients. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you. Shyam, Shyam, are you there? Shyam? Yeah. Shyam is asking, prone for 12 hours, wouldn't that increase pressure so risk? It totally depends on the patients. It's usually a 6 to 12 hours, but you're looking into how the patient is. Um, if you look into uh, videos of, of how it is done, you definitely need specialized people who could do it, you would need a respiratory therapist and interventionist who would hold the head and make sure that it is done properly and the lines are in place and you're continuously monitoring the, um, the hemodynamic status. And the risk of pressure score is increasing, but uh, obviously our um, main and uh, 
prime motive is to get their secretions off, to get the lungs working more and make sure they come off the um, ventilator as quickly as possible, if, uh, if that is possible. Because with patients lying in ICU for 73 days, even with ECMO and everything else, the pressure sore risk obviously increases. That is a complication where we are looking into it. While transporting the patients uh, in centralized uh, zones. So, um, as I said, when the patients are presented in our ED, um, the initial management was to intubate all the patients who are deteriorating. So, you intubate them, and uh, we have specialized way you could only use one path to go towards the um, ITU, and everybody else is also in. Um, also in a dawned in PPE, so you're trying to minimize that risk. Um, I'm not sure if I have actually hyperlinked something here, and it shows you the best practices in terms of uh, transferring the patient. Okay. So any other participant wants to ask any other questions? They can ask on mic also, and they can turn on their video and audio. No, thank you. Okay. No questions? So we are not receiving any other questions. So I guess uh, everyone has learned so many things and it's clear. I think it's clear that all the concepts and all the phenomena you have taught us, it's all clear. If anyone wants to ask any question, you can ask now. Okay. So it was really a witty and informative session, and it has given us new insights about the topic. And we are really thankful to you that you have just you have just given us this chance to work with you, and it was really a pleasure to listen to you. So I'm, you. I'm I'm really grateful to you. You were my senior, and I never thought of this that I will <laughs> I will be getting this opportunity to work with you again. Uh, so this is really, really a wonderful experience for me and for all of us. So we are really thankful to you uh, on behalf of Maharshi Markandeshwar University and Mulana Hospital. I am thanking you and for, on behalf of all the organizing team, I am very, very thankful to you. And we look, for, we look forward that we will be fortunate in, enough to have you again with us. So, Thank you so much, Kusum. I think this was a great opportunity with I could like, you know, focus and reflect on things that is happening. And I really didn't think that this would come through because you're like constantly just working and coming back. But to think of it in a lighter way, this was a good opportunity to connect with everybody and to share things that we are doing and to know if uh, what other things people are doing. Plus, I think, uh, you know, there would be a time where we could actually talk about COVID-19 to our next generation and kids where we won't be saying, oh, we were a part of World War II or World War uh, I. <laughs> we actually were a part of a pandemic and the learnings that we took from there. Thank you so much for the opportunity to you and kudos to all the organizers. Keep doing the good work. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we will be winding up for the today's session. So... Tomorrow is our last day, seventh day. So we will be addressing the mental health issues, how to tackle them. So tomorrow we will be joining back at 2.30 for our session, how to survive the dark days. So till then, we are closing up. I'm thanking you again. Thanks a lot for joining us for this mm -hmm. webinar series. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the participants for joining us. So we will be Great. meeting again tomorrow. Till then, bye-bye. We can sign off. Bye. Take care, guys. See ya. See ya.